Hey, uh, my name is Kevin Petrus. I'm a lieutenant uh, for the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department. I'm assigned to the Public Affairs Office. I want to welcome you to the Law Enforcement Center on the uh, beautiful and warm um, April afternoon. Um, every quarter, CMPD provides a public safety briefing. This brief is important to us because it communicates the state of public safety in our community and it shares uh, what we're doing to, uh, to impact crime and to collaborate with our community. Today, we're going to be sharing a full overview of crime statistics through the first quarter of 2024. So that it runs from January 1st, 2024 through April, I'm sorry, through March 31st of 2024. You're going to hear references to percentage increase or decrease today um, during the briefing. When we use these numbers, it's a comparison to the same time period last year, which would be the first quarter of 2023. In the first quarter of 2024, overall crime in Charlotte rose 3%. Overall crime numbers are comprised of two main categories. That's property crime and violent crime. Violent crime decreased 1%, while property crime rose 4%. The violent crime category includes incidents such as homicides, rapes, robberies, and aggravated assaults, which includes shootings. Again, violent crime is down 1% this year. 911 calls that required a patrol response increased 3%. And CMPD's total police interactions also rose 3%. What that means is that our officers are doing more now than they did before, face-to-face, -face, directly with our community. We're incredibly proud of the efforts of all of our employees and the initiatives that we have undertaken as a department. We have two speakers today who will help us look more in depth at crime statistics and to provide some additional context. Joining us first will be CMPD Deputy Chief Zeru Chicory, spelling as Z-E-R-U, last name's Chicory, C-H-I-C-K-O-R-E-E, -E. and he will be followed by Major Brett Balabucky, spelling as B-R-E-T, last name Balabucky, B-A-L-A-M-U-C-K-I. First up is Deputy Chief Chicory. Thank you, Lieutenant Petrus. Good afternoon, everyone. Charlotte is one of the top five fastest growing cities in the country. And on average, more than 100 people move to the Charlotte region each day. Despite this rapid growth, overall violent crime incidents fell a full percentage point in the first quarter of 2024. That includes a 3% decrease in aggravated assaults and a 4% decrease in assault with a deadly weapon involving a firearm. Before we dive into our strategic initiatives and some of the incredible work our officers have done to reduce violent crime, we have to acknowledge the extremely disappointing start to the year in the term of our homicide numbers. Any homicide in Charlotte is one too many, but 34 in three months is an alarming number and a pace that we should not tolerate as a city. Just look at the number of people standing in this room right now. And 34, you can think of the impact it can have. These numbers represent victims who have had families and friends who will never be the same. As a department, we get asked, what are we doing to fix this issue? Why is this happening so often? Hopefully, we, as concerned citizens, community members, and neighbors, can make a positive impact to reduce the violence that is becoming far too routine. The community can help us get out in front of what is happening in their neighborhoods. Don't put blinders on to warning signs. If you see suspicious behavior, call us first. Request a community roll call. For those of you that are not familiar, community roll calls are when a police division meet at the beginning of their shifts in the areas which are having issues. Our officers do these to increase police presence in those areas and to address the concerns of businesses and community members. You can even call your community officer to request those, or you can even call um, any of your neighborhood officers, even call the, the district office that you have um, to get and speak to a supervisor to request one. We really want to emphasize our officers are here to address your safety concerns. We've said this before, but it's as important as ever. Know where your children are and make it your business to know what they're doing and who they're associating with. 
Community policing is what CMPD is about. The stronger the connections between our officers and the citizens they serve, the more we can help prevent violent crime and solve crime as a community. Look out for your family and your neighbors. We need people to stop and think before making a decision that will shatter lives, both the life of the victim and the life of the suspect. De-escalation in our communities needs to happen routinely so conflicts aren't being settled but just a pull of a trigger. While preventing homicides is our ultimate goal, we do want to acknowledge the incredible work that CMPD's homicide unit has done so far this year. While it's still very early in the year and our clearance rate only gets better as the year goes on, the homicide unit has already cleared 70% of our cases this year. Our five-year average, which we report out typically at the end of the year in 2023, was as high as 80%. The national average is just over 50%. We are truly among the best in the nation at solving homicides. And through our partnership with the district attorney's office for getting justice for our victims and their families. With Charlotte growing so rapidly, particularly in apartment communities, we have continued to prioritize safety in the uptown Charlotte area. Our Southeast Service Area Patrol Major, who you'll hear from next, has done a fantastic job allocating officers to maintain a strong police presence, both through routine, daily patrols, and of course during our major events, which are held in uptown Charlotte. At the end of year public safety briefing, we shared the results from Operation Heartbeat. This initiative helped reduce violent crime incidents in the areas of the Transit Center and the Spectrum Center by 36% last year. Building on the success of that initiative, Central Division launched Operation TRIO this year and added additional areas to the footprint. Operation TRIO, which is short for Targeted Response for Intervention and Outreach, that operation has utilized proactive patrols to target high trafficked areas, including the Transit Center, Spectrum Center, Romare Bearden Park, First Ward Park, and Fourth Ward Park. So far in 2024, Operation TRIO is responsible for over 45 arrests and four firearm seizures. The majority of these arrests involve repeat offenders who have frequent run-ins with officers and present continuous issues in the uptown area. Our Central Division is proud to report that so far in 2024, violent crime incidents have fallen 13% in uptown with crop property crimes dropping nearly a full percentage point. That's a huge win considering the growing population in uptown. Now CMPD's Real-Time Crime Center is an invaluable resource for the department in assisting with searches for suspects, pursuits, and overall investigations. Our RTCC monitors cameras throughout the city providing real-time updates and performing license plate reader hits for officers and detectives on the streets. So far, the efforts of our RTCC staff have resulted in over 163 enforcement outcomes, including arrests and 40 suspects were identified as persons of interest. Here are a couple cases of, ex of, of great work done by our RTCC. On January 29th, a detective was proactively monitoring a camera monitoring Brookshire Boulevard and Hoskins Road. He observed a distinctive looking Jeep that strongly resembled a vehicle that was used in an auto theft the day prior in the Metro Division on Freedom Drive. The detective notified Metro and Freedom Division officers who responded to locate the vehicle. The driver was detained and identified as 18-year-old James Antonio Johnson. He had active warrants for auto theft and was placed under arrest. Mr. Johnson is a prolific auto theft suspect with multiple prior felony arrests. During the search of his vehicle, officers also located a gun with an obliterated serial number. Here's another example. On February 2nd, RTCC detectives were proactively monitoring a camera in the 1100 block of West Shore Creek Road. They observed an occupied vehicle which was reported stolen in a parking lot and notified both patrol officers and our aviation unit. Officers quickly arrived and attempted a traffic stop on the vehicle, which then fled. Officers did not pursue, but tracked the vehicle with the help of the RTCC cameras and CMPD's helicopter receiving real-time updates. The vehicle was involved in a collision nearby and two occupants were taken into custody. A stolen firearm and numerous firearm parts were seized from the vehicle. 
The driver of the vehicle, 20-year-old Jordan Simone Davis, was charged with possession of a stolen motor vehicle, felony, flee to elude, and resist, obstruct, and delay. Our patrol officers, RTCC, telecommunications, aviation, K-9 units, and other specialty units all do a phenomenal job working in tandem to quickly arrest dangerous and repeat offenders. However, in order for CMPD to operate and utilize our resources at full effectiveness, we need to be as close to being fully staffed as possible. Recruitment has been one of Chief Jennings' top priorities. It's no secret that interest in a law enforcement career has fallen over the years, and we are also competing against other departments, both locally and nationally, to attract other qualified candidates. We are very proud of our efforts here at CMPD. Our recruitment division does tireless work going to career events, universities, military bases, and more to talk to potential recruits. Our public affairs office also does great work with marketing and showcasing the endless opportunities within the department. I'm happy to report overall hiring for the department increased by 69% in the first quarter compared to the same time frame in 2023. Additionally, we've seen an 86% increase in sworn applications in the first quarter, and we're very happy to report that. On Friday, we are getting ready to graduate 58 recruits from the 196 recruit class. And of course, during this year, we introduced a fourth yearly recruitment class, which will start later in the year. In the past, we have only had three classes per year. This fourth class is in addition to a yearly lateral recruit class. We are definitely trending in the right direction in reducing our officer shortage, but there's still a long way to go. Right now, there are 191 vacant officer positions, down 20%. We're including in our current staffing number the police recruits who are employed with CMPD but haven't graduated and hit the streets yet for patrol. If anyone watching today is seeking employment and wants to help make their community a better place to live, head to joincmpd.com. Our starting salary right now for an officer is a little over $57,000. Officers can, however, earn up to more than $111,000 if they qualify for all incentives. Behind me on the screen, you'll see a list of numerous incentives offered by our department, including pay incentives for education, secondary language, shift differential, hiring bonus, and more. This year, we are also excited about introducing our brand new civilian traffic investigator program. This program is on track to launch this July. You can see behind me the early renderings for the vehicles that our investigators will drive. The purpose of this program is to have a team of 16 well-trained civilians who will investigate property damage only crashes. As you can imagine, this will free up our officers to focus on higher priority calls for service, including those involving violent crime. In 2022, officers spent more than 31,000 hours responding to these types of crashes, which will now be handled by our new civilian traffic investigators. Before hitting the streets, they will undergo a four-week intense training program and obtain a certification through the North Carolina Justice Academy. These jobs have already been posted, are in the process right now of being filled. Applicants need a high school diploma and a valid North Carolina or South Carolina driver's license. They will also, of course, have to undergo a background check, drug screening test, and a physical examination. This is a full-time position with full city benefits. The salary range is between forty-six dollars and $52,000. This program is going to be a major benefit to the overall resources of the department as we continue to navigate a nationwide officer shortage. At this time, I'd like to bring up Major Brett Balamuki over the Southeast Patrol Service Area to talk about more department initiatives for the year. Major Balamuki. Thank you, Chief Chickory. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Uh, I'm Major Brett Balamucky. I am the major over the Southeast Service Bureau that includes Uptown. Uh, today, I'm happy and, and proud to announce that we had a violent crime decrease in the first quarter. Uh, we do have a property increase of 4%. And as we've talked about many times before, 30% of that increase, we had a 30% increase in auto thefts. 
which ultimately drives so many of our property numbers. You know, the biggest in issue continues to be the Kia Hyundai thefts that we've talked about numerous times uh, that we've been dealing with for over two years. Uh, one of the things that, you know, as we look about this, it, had we taken out the Kia Hyundai thefts, we would be down 3% overall in property for the city. 70% of all the cars stolen so far this year are Kia and Hyundais. Uh, that's 68% up from last year. So our total number is 1,941 for the first quarter, either auto thefts or attempts. That's 21 cars a day that are either stolen or attempted to be stolen. Let me say that again, 21 a day. And when you look at, you know, how many of those are committed by juveniles, and we'll talk about some of those numbers here in a second, but that, that's, that's alarming to all of us. And it has such a great impact on other crimes and different things that occur from these stolen vehicles. One thing I am proud and I want to announce is on February 23rd, our University City Division uh, partnered with Hyundai Motor Corp and did a free uh, anti-theft software upgrade for Hyundais, uh, partnering with PNC Music Pavilion. Uh, at that event, they gave away steering locks and did a free up software upgrade to 671 cars. So great turnout. We look forward to future events in the, that are coming up later this year. And we, hi, I highly urge everyone that if you have a Hyundai to come to the event and get your upgrade. If you have a Kia, work that out through your dealership. Um, but it's very important that everyone takes the time to get that security upgrade done so that you take your vehicle out of the pool of being stolen on at, at a pace of 21 a day. You know, as we talk about enforcement, you know, one of the things that we continue to see is just the repeat offenders, right? So out of 279 auto theft arrests made so far this year, first quarter, 222 of those were juveniles. 222 juveniles arrested, a 20% increase. Some of those juveniles had been arrested, you know, in, in last year, this year, up to a dozen times. They're stealing up to a dozen cars a year. Uh, four out of five auto theft arrests being made are being made of juveniles. You know, Chief Jennings has said many times to the community, we can't arrest our way out of this. You know, we can't do strictly enforcement to try to change the behavior that continues to, to create these dozens of cars stolen over and over again, that we really need support from the entire city for the youth so that we can try to take the repeat offenders out of this cycle, like imagine a hamster wheel and they're just stuck on it, and try to divert them uh, to a better path so that they can get rehabilitation services towards a structured environment, um, because playing catch and release, the officers, all our officers do a fantastic job. As you see, 222 arrests of juveniles for auto theft, 279 arrests for auto theft this year alone, first quarter. But we continue to have this spike and these numbers go up because we're not able to just break the cycle with the arrests. Um, you know, the chief spoken and written about local support on the issue. Uh, he has the support of local leaders. You know, he's advocated for the reopening of Mecklenburg County's one and only juvenile detention center, Jail North, uh, because the capacity with Raise the Age does not meet the needs that we're seeing that with the juvenile offenders. So we've got to look as a, as a city, as a whole, on how we can make those commitments in areas that are going to have a great impact on, on the issues that we're facing. You know, I think that one of the promising things that we do see is that violent crime with juveniles so far this year has been down. Uh, we've got property crime up 12% on known juvenile cases and that we're dropped 6% for violent cases. Uh, we've had 21 shootings of known juveniles so far this year. What's alarming with that is 17 of those 21 were a type of crime where the juveniles shoot into an occupied property, either a vehicle or a house. And the impact that that has is, is really that what we see is that they start to argue over social media. 
They start to have disagreements and arguments, and they immediately turn to gunfire. And what they're doing is they're shooting into relatives, homes, people, friends, the target people that they're having the disagreements with, but they're turning to gunfire with that. So imagine that in the first quarter of this year, of those 17 juvenile-related shooting cases, 74 victims were inside those pieces of property. 74. So they're having dinner, they're watching TV, they're, they're, they're you know, hanging out with the family. Many of these had children playing in the, in the house. Suddenly the walls erupt in gunfire. That's the stuff that is unacceptable and that really should be a call to action for us all because the amount of rounds that are fired into these homes where they can't even see the target they're shooting at, don't even know who's in the house, that needs the full leverage of all of, of CMPD and our partners and our community partners to stop that behavior. Because that's just one of the most dangerous things that we could ever see or deal with. And has tragically resulted in deaths that we've all mourned in the past where people are innocently hit. And many times the homes that they shoot up or the vehicles, they're not even the correct address. So you're shooting up a, a, someone that isn't even somebody who lives at that location anymore. You know, as, as we see the back and forth shootings, CMPD's commitment has been seen in the crime gun suppression team. That's a team of detectives that specifically work on these kind of, uh, these kind of shootings and uh, the most violent crimes and go after the most violent criminals. Uh, this year, I'm proud to announce that, that CMPD is adding uh, JADE, which is Juvenile Accountability and Diversion Empowerment Team, to the mix. And what JADE is, is JADE is, you know, we've realized that simply arresting the juveniles and giving them back to their parents does not break the cycle. You know, we've got our J post officers, which are priority offender uh, juvenile detectives officers, and that they specifically look at the most high risk kids. They're basically a case manager for some of our high, high, high offenders. So they go to court, they deal with the judges, they talk and meet with the judges, they do home visits, but really our commitment of CMPD is to say, what more could we do? And Jade is a piece of that. So Jade now is giving more officers, more resources to really specifically try to monitor where they do juvenile investigations, operations, and monitoring the most high-risk youth. Uh, the education part to try to stop the recidivism is really just the, the, the commitment and care to get them to get their lives back on track. One of the things Jade officers do with the, the, the uh, juvenile post-offender officers is they do home visits. They're going into the homes and visiting one-on-one -on -one with the family members and the uncles and aunts and, and, and and relatives and friends and family and having real conversations about what do you need and how do we break this cycle? And I'm really proud of the responses. A lot of these relationships that have been built from that, family and friends have called those officers direct and said, hey, he ran away again tonight. Can you help me get him, get him back or her? And, and, and those relationships built are starting to have great outcomes because we're able to gather information to where even the relatives sometimes want their, their juvenile safe. And when you're talking about kids that are 12 and 13 years old committing violent acts, they, they aren't man mentally making the right decisions. So the Jade officer's relationship with the J-Post officers is really starting to take hold, and it's really showing a commitment on how we can try to divert them away from just criminal acts by just arrest, right? Um, so far this year, the Jade teams applied for 10 secure custody orders uh, through the Department of Juvenile Justice. And I'll tell you, that's one of the greatest things that we've started to see from this initiative is that there's daily conversations between the Department of Juvenile Justice supervisors and our Jade supervisors and those relationships that are being built so that it's not a us pointing at you, you pointing at us, why can't we get this fixed, but really collaboratively looking at how do we how do we be able to come to a resolutions with these complicated issues as a team and as 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 partners uh they've got tw the the j teams made 24 um enforcement actions 
They've seized narcotics. They've cut. They've recovered five stolen vehicles. They've gotten seven firearms. You know, but even with all the arrests, even with the firearms they recovered, even with the stolen vehicles they recovered, what I'm really proud of to, to announce in us as CMPD is they've made 27 home visits. That's 27 visits where they're one-on-one -on -one with family members in the house, in our communities, trying to come up with a different pathway. Uh, as we continue to partner with the district attorney's office and DJJ, you know, it just, Jade is one piece of a commitment that CMPD is showing towards juvenile crime and, and diversion of that. Uh, another initiative is the fifth element. So the fifth element was piloted last year where we took it really, it, it, it was birthed from discussions in our command meetings where the same kids' names popped up week after week. And so one of, you know, the lieutenants uptown said, you know what, I'm going to make a, a, a specific effort at going to their houses, talking to the families. He picked them up, took them, and started playing basketball with them. And, and at first, he got a lot of pushback. But long term, he got so many community members, and the team of Fifth Element got so many community members involved that it really, last year was 12, it's a, it's a monthly cycle where they learn things like how to do a job interview. Something that might be simple for some, but not simple for others. You know how to how to how to dress, how to go to a formal event. You know how to uh, have conflict resolution. And I'm so proud to look at all the partners that you know from the Urban League, the NAACP, you know our own human resources uh, command personnel here in CMPD went and taught classes to them and to see them light up because they're getting an opportunity that somebody has hope that they could do more than just commit crime it gives us all hope uh, that has now went from two participants last year that this year there are five in the fifth element uh, program and we're really I think these are just commitments to show you that Chief Jennings is dedicated to his commitment towards changing the culture of youth crime and violence. And, you know, we can't do it alone, but I think that if we lead that and we continue to lean on partnerships in the community, that we're going to be able to kind of see some great results with this. Uh, I'll wrap up with an update on Scarlett. You know, we talked about Scarlett here for a while, uh, stolen car and recovery law enforcement team. Always very proud of the work that our Scarlet team has done. There, there's uh, detectives assigned to the Scarlet unit. And they're really, you know, their focus has always been taking down criminal networks that do high value vehicle thefts. But with that, they get into so much more. Recently released Department of Justice uh, did an update on some indictments, right? You had Aaron Woodson and Andre Sumner. They're arrested on your screen there on two separate investigations. I can't say enough how much the partnership with the U.S. Attorney's Office of the Western District of the United States has had with our team and detectives to have positive outcomes with this. Because, you know, as we peeled the curtain back is what I like to say, we really had no idea what was going on with the stolen cars on the high ends, right? You have the Kia Hyundais from the juveniles, and you have the high end where they're changing VIN numbers, getting fictitious titles, where they could sell them through DMV with a fictitious title, right? The amount of search warrants that have led to, on these two gentlemen, they did search warrants that led to eight high end vehicles recovered, uh, all, all with fictitious titles and VINs, large amount of firearms, narcotics, cash. So far this year for 2024, Scarlett's had 39 arrests, seized 35 vehicles worth $2.4 million. You know, they've seized 23 firearms, 156,000 in cash, and 172 pounds of narcotics. Uh, we're extremely proud of these numbers and the impact that Scarlett is having on cleaning up the streets of Charlotte. Thank you. Thank you, Major and, and Deputy Chief. Um, you heard a lot there. That's just through the first quarter of 2024, and um, certainly we're well on our way in through the um, through the second quarter of 2024. And I wanted to take a moment to remind you of the of the priorities for CMPD in 2024 because those remain unchanged. Um, number one, it's a continued focus on reducing violent crime in our community. Number two, it's a focus on reducing 
automobile property crimes. And let me just point out for, for one and two, there's a, a new and renewed emphasis on, on the juvenile component um, for both of those, for property crime and for violent crime. Number three is a focus on recruiting and retaining. Um, something that you heard about today and the, and the success that we've had. And number four, CMPD serves. That's our customer service um, e experience here that, that we train um, our employees in um, to provide the best service that we can both internally and externally. So those are the priorities for 2024. Again, those remain the same. And that's something that we'll be working on um, as we move forward. Uh, we do have a media release out, out to everyone that, that breaks down all of the um, different categories in detail. So I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, I think we're ready for some questions. Um, Deputy Chief Chickory and Major Balmucky are, are available. Do we have any? Sir. Um, Jeff Cameron with the Charlotte Observer. I'm curious as to um, why is this done on a quarter basis? You know, crime could end up falling by the end of the year because the murders sure. actually fell in Charlotte by the end of the year. So why are we looking at first quarters and comparing them to past years? And why are we only doing one year compared to the previous year and not maybe like a trend like from the last 10 years? Okay, so I, I, to, let me answer your first question. I think it's important for us to be transparent about the work that we do as an agency and about the, the state of crime and public safety in our community. Um, we, we feel that keeping, ha having the, the, the lines of communication open, keeping those in our community and, and um, our partners here in the media um, abreast as to, to what the, the, the conditions are, in our city is important. So that, that's why we're here quarterly. We're committed to it. Chief Jennings is committed to it, in fact, um, to, to be here every quarter, to give a mid-year, to give, um, to give a, a year end, to produce, um, to produce a, a report at the end of the year um, that, that details all of the, the, the crime statistics, but again, also um, more specifically the things that we're doing in the community and the things that we're doing to, to address um, the needs of our community. Thanks. What are you most proud of when you look at this report? And then on the other end, what do you? What is the, the biggest cause for concern? Sure, I'm gonna let uh, Chief Chair. I think, uh, listen, Major Balamuk, you broke it down really um, clearly. Uh, certainly, these programs we have, Jade especially, um, is really a huge priority, and I think it's a win for our community to see the kind of work that our men and women do. Uh, I know certainly. Uh, Major Balamuki has really spearheaded that drive. Fifth Element actually came out first, and the scope of it was a bit small, uh, first affecting just a couple um, you know, young people, a couple of juveniles. Um, when you sit in our patrol command meetings that happen here weekly, right, and you hear their names brought up over and over for types of crime, and I don't want to speak ill of our, our friends at the Department of Juvenile Justice because they are, they are like us. They are in a business of trying to keep communities safe and they have a job and a role to do. But CMPD touches these kids, right? We touch them, we see them, we hear them, we see the frustration in their families. You think that these kids have parents that don't like them? I think it's the opposite. Their, their mom and dads are terrified that something's going to happen to one of them. And, you know, a lot of times through circumstances that people have no control over, they may not be able to find employment. They may not have childcare. And these children, you know, while we talk about it takes a community to raise them, right, they don't have that, maybe that same community that we all did, right? So what we did with these programs is actually try and become that community for them and try and say, hey, you know what, my name is Aru. Okay, I understand you've had some issues. Some of them are quite serious. What can we do to help you get out of this lifestyle? Do you have a driver's license? You can't get one yet? How can we get you an ID card? Listen. Let's, do you, would you like to know how to, to go shopping and, and get you know, clothes to wear so that you're not being ostracized? Uh, listen, social media is, is a damaging phenomenon to young, to young people. And as Major Balamuki spoke about it, think about the types of crimes, violent crimes, right? Murders that have happened as a result of people's use of social media. While I wish today that high schools would offer a class on the dangers of social media. We don't quite have that yet in a curriculum. However, um, we have to deal with the fallout. So what are we most proud of? I would say the interactions we have with our community programs, um, not just for when people uh, commit crime, not just you know, with Jade or Fifth Element, but through the Police Athletic League, through Reach, Reach Out, through Envision, some of the community programs CMPD has, which is widely supported by our business community here and the city of Charlotte. Um, and of course, our connections that we have with people. So, I mean, to be quite honest, what we're proud of is our, remember, this is a police department doing this, 
right? This is a police department taking the time to do community service work, and I feel ultimately that's what the chief's vision is for us. Like, yes, is it our responsibility? No, right? But how do we impact the city with some type of, of real performance measures by having these young men and women get a life where they don't have to feel like recidivating is their only option. They can climb out, yes, of a, of a life of crime because they're young, right? We never argue with raise the age. Raise the age is not a bad thing. Right? Give young people a chance to not be punished their whole life because they aren't as developed well. So, yeah, when we're proud of our initiatives, our community programs, and we stand by them. And then the biggest um, you know, point that you need to improve on? For improvement, uh, you know, honestly, I think we have to get more officers on the street, right? Because the community expectations are, are there people there? When you, when you get into a fender bender, look at our new uh, civilian crash investigators. If you've ever had a wreck in Charlotte and it's a property damage and you hear it's going to be about two and a half hours, sir, right? That's what this is about. You saw 31,000 hours being spent by officers. What do you think those 31,000 hours could be spent on if there were violent crime reduction initiatives, right? Or if we had more time to dedicate to the programs like Jade and Fifth Element? Those 31,000 hours can now be spent with programs that we know can elicit a more positive response for the community. So, you know, yeah, we, we have things we have to work on. I, I think getting our numbers up right now is a, is a great, I mean, I know, as uh, Lieutenant Petras mentioned, it's still one of the Chief's top priorities. But listen, we really want to push to get our officers fully staffed so that we can make them as effective as they need to be and we can keep our violent crime down and even, and of course, our property crime down as well. And hopefully in the meantime, our community programs are working in tandem to help bring down those, you know, those, those initiatives. Yes, sir. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about the civilian investigative unit? Do other towns have them and what kind of powers do they have? I guess? So basically, uh, great question. Um, and this actually was something that was passed by the North Carolina State Legislature. So and as recent as last year. And we got the authority. Uh, this program was piloted in Wilmington, North Carolina. And, you know, we, they were able to use some data. We certainly, the chief, he, when the chief took over uh, back in 2020, this was one of his ideas that he wanted to actually have this type of program in place. But it wasn't supported by statute. So now we have that statute in place. And the city graciously gave us the mechanism to do it. They purchased vehicles. They're going to give, you know, a salary with benefits. And they now... You know, that gives us the impetus to basically go out, get this work done, and reallocate uh, those hours that are being spent, you know, on these non-injury property damage only crashes. And as you can see from the vehicles, I mean, they're going to come out, be able to take what's necessary for the report, and hopefully also delay the wait times that you and I would come across if we just get into a fender bender in a parking lot somewhere. So they don't have any power to be able to detain somebody at a scene? While they no, they do not. This is not, this is, when they say investigator, they investigate the civil issues involved in a property damage only crash. They are not going to be issuing citations. They are not going to be placing people under arrest. And they're certainly not going to be detaining people. Now, if it were, you know, if it were to become contentious, we obviously would have a protocol in place. But likely that would then involve the involvement of a uniformed sworn officer to come either mitigate that circumstance or end up taking the call completely. So we certainly want our investigators to be safe. But, you know, we want you all to know that this is just really a great program to, to kind of bolster our, our uh, customer service. You know, I mean, because you might... You may never have an involvement with CMPD, but if you wait two and a half hours for a property damage call, you might, well, they're not really that responsive. But you have to think about where things are triaged and prioritized for us, and this program will actually really help us with that. Hunter, let's go. Deputy Chief, amongst homicides, I know juveniles are causing a lot of the property crime as well, but are you all seeing a growing number of suspects and victims of homicides become, being juveniles? Well, I think you can just look to the news for that and see that we are seeing some of those, some of those numbers. Uh, we won't really know until the end of the year, you know, what those numbers look like to provide you. We will give you, of course, last year's numbers. But yes, absolutely. What do you think these crimes lead to? When you're firing multiple rounds, first of all, access to firearms is a bad thing. Terror, you know, it's just a bad thing. Um, but then you have a person who is also inexperienced, right, without, without the, the sense of consequence that an adult would have. Um, and that's, that's really an issue. So yes, are we seeing a rise in violent crime? These things don't just stop at SIODs, 
right? They stop, ultimately they'll get to a homicide. That's, that's what we're trying to prevent. That's what these programs, that's why we're such, it's such a panic for us to kind of get these programs up and running and invest time and resources into them. So yes, are, you know, are we seeing a, a, an increase in juveniles? Really, if we see any juveniles committing murder or getting murdered, it's an issue. And you know, we don't want it to get to a point where it, it ultimately cripples the city or causes you know, like a, you know, a huge panic. Um, you know, and think about the loved ones. Think about if you, if you, any of us, my, myself being a parent, the loss of your child. And think about a, the loss of that child during, during a homicide, right? Just think about the impact it has, losing someone. Maybe you've lost someone. Maybe someone in the community knows that loss, right? And of course, there's a, you know, I'm not saying or taking away the responsibility of the person who did it, but if, you know, you, if you're the parent of a person who committed that act, how do you feel? You know, you know you're going to lose your loved one too as well. It's just, and it's, the, the, the bottom line is, it's unnecessary, right? And that's why it's so important for all of us. Friends, family, don't wait to reach out to people after they've committed an act or been a victim of it. Talk to them, right? Talk to them. You know, monitor their social media. You don't have to be, if you're a parent, be their parent. You don't have to be their friend. Talk to them about who you're, who, who's your friend group. Know who they are. Know their names. Know where they go. Why would you not know where your child is at, at 11 a.m., excuse me, 11 p.m. on a Friday night? I would know you know, where my, my children are, and I want that for, I mean, we really, when we talk about these things, they're not just for the sake of us talking about them. We want people to understand. Reach out to your young people. Find out what the issues are. Maybe they're being bullied. Maybe they, you don't know these things until you talk to them. Find out. You talk about a big type of the cause being arguments either on social media or from school that lead to shootings and such. But how much is retaliation taking place in this city when it comes to our homicides? Well, that's difficult to say because we know it happens, um, you know, and, and certainly a, a lot of the shootings are definitely retaliatory related. It would be difficult just to quantify that without actually taking a deeper dive into the numbers, but I can tell you that it does happen. I mean, homicides are people's, you know, people when they use violence to resolve a problem, it starts really basic, right? It starts with a, with a I'm frustrated. Okay, and that frustration is going to grow to anger. And unfortunately, if people are not socialized, how to handle and deal with frustrating things that they come across, they're going to resort to what? What they know from when they're young, and they're going to resort to violence. Now, putting a gun in the hand of somebody who is frustrated and only knows how to act emotionally to respond, what are they going to do? We know why using a handgun is so effective, because all you have to do is move, curl your finger in. That's it. That's why pulling a trigger. While as senseless an act as that, why would such a senseless act lead to such tragedy? And that's why it's so bad. When you can just, anybody can pull a trigger here. And that's the problem. So, yes. Um, when we're looking at other groups, I know you mentioned the, the groups that you guys are working with to help um, break down um, youth crime, et cetera. But when we're looking at things like um, the alternative to violence group that the, Char the city of Charlotte has been working with, um, they've been proven to um, help reduce crime and so forth, but their funding is kind of in jeopardy and so forth. When, we're looking at working all together, community leaders, city leaders, and so forth. Do you feel like the city should be pushing to be funding programs like this? I don't know if you see or kind of look at the work they do to see how that helps together to kind of bring Yeah, I mean, listen, the, the city manager, is a, he's a smart guy. And I can tell you that I'm sure at, at that level they're having discussions, you know, with what the opportunities are with the city. I will tell you that we cannot solve this problem alone. And we would like to see our community partners, you know, tasked. I can tell you that the clergy groups, for example, are really good about reaching out to CMPD and trying to offer some of the programs they have. And these community partners we have, whether it be, you know, some that we know that are typical, like the NAACP, that do great work and try and, you know, influence our young folks. Uh, you know, some of our homegrown folks here, like the Mecklenburg Council of Elders and other people that we have around town that really have a stake in trying to bring up and uplift young people. You know, do we want to see those programs supported? Sure. Can the city do it? Yes. Can private business do it? Yes. So it's really just a willingness of who is holding the purse to say, yes, I would like, you know, I believe in your program. You know, I'd love to support it. And, you know, the biggest thing they look for, I can tell you, is accountability, right? We do know with public funding, CMPD can show accountability, right? So obviously, you know, people have concerns about how your tax dollars are spent. But uh, I would venture to say that, yeah, those, those things were being discussed. And I, you know, we wouldn't turn them down. We would love to see community organizations supported, whether or not um, you know, they're supported, whether through public funds or private funds. 
And then, you know, the Wall Street Journal just put out a report that showed that, like, major cities like New York, Philadelphia, and so forth are seeing major drops um, in deadly shootings and so forth, and we're obviously a fast-growing city and so forth, and we're seeing a jump in our homicides. Do you look to see, like, what other cities are doing, and, like, is there any comments on that? Well, it's, it's interesting because he brought up a point about why we do things quarterly, and we do things quarterly so we can measure things, right? So typically, we see ups and downs throughout the year. Uh, last month, for example, we saw an up, and then we're, we're back down in the, in the downward part for this month. Um, we always see violent crime kind of spike in the city, usually you know, late, late part of the summer. It comes back up again. And so we compare things quarterly so we can look at, for example, in the first quarter this year, how do we compare to last year? What are we doing right and what are we doing wrong? And what adjustments do we need to make to make sure we're allocating patrol? I know our uh, Deputy Chief for Patrol Services, Chief Robinson, he has a job to actually reallocate our resources weekly. That's why we have that command staff meeting on Mondays here where he brings all his captains in, talks to them, and where are the issues going on. So we can't really account for that until it quantifies it in a report. Typically, we look for a three-month style report, which, you know, it's an annual. Obviously, the year is broken up in quarters. But if you do it every three months, we know we might not just have had a flash of vehicles getting broken into in January, but that same thing didn't occur in February. Now, if it occurs January, February, March, we have a real issue. So we have to then reallocate resources to push. Like with the auto thefts, it's all hands on deck right now with the auto theft, right? Because we're we're seeing a constant rise in auto thefts, even from last year's numbers, which were high. So, you know, ultimately, the reason that we, we have these meetings, why we have this drive for resources, and when you compare it to other cities, we don't like to compare ourselves to other large cities. Look, you know, look at Memphis's homicides for last year. You know, I mean, I believe there were almost, almost 400 homicides in the city of Memphis last year. Look at Chicago's homicides. Chicago is really just a, a few times larger than the city of Charlotte, if you look at the scope of Charlotte and look at the difference in the homicide rate if you look at the per capita for Chicago and the city of Charlotte. So we don't really, yes, I mean, do we compare ourselves to other cities? Yes, because I wouldn't have known that if I didn't. But the other part being, you know, what we do here is we compare what we do. How are you treated in those cities by the police, right? Here, I always tell people I'd love for my mom or dad to get stopped by a Charlotte police officer because there's an expectation of how they're going to be treated and how their interaction is going to be. So those are the things we can control, right? And that's what we work on to get better. And they have residual effects such as better decision making, better outcomes, more positive interactions. So while homicides can still happen, we still have to maintain some level of professionalism for the job to be basically like a beacon, you know, if instead of us really looking at them, they should be looking at us to see what we're doing and some of the strategies we're looking at to help reduce crime in their, in their jurisdictions. So One if, or two you, if, if you are comparing yourself to yourself, you know, quarter to quarter, what went wrong last quarter versus this quarter amongst, regarding homicides? Why do we see more? Homicide is one of the most difficult things to predict. Because a homicide can encounter by, hap by just a circumstance that no one can predict, right? Um, the only one real predictor of homicides that I can tell you that really impacts across every demographic are domestic violence homicides, for example, right? And we have those, and we've had those, and we'll continue to have them as sad as that is. Um, there are a number of things that impact violent crime, and I want you guys to pay attention to it. It has to do with the amount of people really between the ages of 16 and 24 that's within any population at any given time, right? And the reason for that is, is that population typically isn't well, as well developed yet. So that means that they're not able to make the decisions that you and I would make from, an, from a perspective of what's consequence look like or what are my options, right? So that's why these youth programs we have really target that demographic. We, we really look at things, right? Criminal justice is not just... An, an idea. It's a, it's a profession. And we have to look at every little tiny variable. So looking, when we compare statistics from quarter to quarter, from half the year, half the year, yearly, yearly, I mean, we even have, we have a five-year average we look at just to make sure that our numbers aren't. Our, on our crime report, we have a five-year average we look at. We compare it by week. We compare it by month. We compare it by a five-year average by year. Right? We look at every single demographic you think that we, we can touch from policing, and we have a comparative analysis so that we can figure out 
What can we do better? Now, I can tell you not a lot of organizations do that, but we do. We have that type of accountability here within the city. And frankly, the city should be happy that their department is doing that kind of work because you've obviously provided us with a budget to make those things work. So yes, we do analyze just about every part of it. And our scope, you know, going back to homicides specifically, homicides are one of the most difficult thing to predict. I will tell you, I mean, we could tell you if you don't get on social media as much as a population, you probably have less homicides, right? Because the back and forth that goes on that we've seen here, especially in the city and, that, and nationwide too as well. Right? So you have a number of variables, but it's so difficult to predict with the homicide. Really, um, you know, for example, the amount of uh, work available in a community can have an impact. Right? How many people are actually employed versus how many people are unemployed? These are basic things that we can all understand. So there are a lot of variables, but for us, we've been there a lot of times when shootings have happened, just so you're aware. So yeah, have we been there? Yeah, we've been there plenty of times when homicides, you know, we've, how many times has an officer just walking up likely prevented the homicide? We see people stop and turn and go the other way. Our violence interruption program that's going on right now in these corridors, that's what that's about, right? The city invested in those violence interrupters to go out there and talk and, and to hope to diffuse a conflict that's going on. Well, police officers do that daily. So we're not going to be there for everyone. We can't be there because of the, you know, the freedoms people have, right, and their privacy. So it's a difficult thing, but homicide, certainly it happened, and we'd like to you know, be as proactive as we can. But as far as a particular variable that led to that spike, there's really not one that I can single in on. Otherwise, we would be working on it. Final question. I'm going to Casey. What are young people saying that they need to break this cycle of crime? Well, that's a difficult question, but I can tell you from having a 15-year-old, you know, some things that um, the dynamics of growing up in school, right? Listen, these kids, and I, of course, I'm 50 years old, so growing up, being born in 73, and, you know, but think about all the images of violence that, uh, that young people are exposed to now. What happens when you see things over and over and over and then that are emulated in any social setting you see, right? So you, you, you're exposed to images of violence. You see it occurring in the street. You see it occurring in your neighborhoods at home. And I grew up right here in Enderley Park in West Charlotte, right? And I can tell you that as a young man growing up and then seeing murder around me and seeing, you know, the hurt that it would cause my neighbor's son was murdered at 18 year old. I was his only son. It caused me and my brother really going to policing. Um, you know, seeing that that type of just you know what the young people want. I think young people just want to one be successful is what they want. They want the tools to do that, and if they're not given the tools to do it, then we're trying right now as an agency to help give those an opportunity that wouldn't otherwise have that, right? Uh, the police athletic league, for example, um, you know, the kids that have football. Look, these are kids that are from impoverished communities, right? We give them an opportunity to play football. We buy the best equipment for them. We support them to help build their confidence up and their abilities to make good decisions and stay out of violent crime. So as far as young people want, I think they want the same thing all of us want. One, they want to be successful. They want to live. They want to be free of harassment. They want to feel like they're wanted and cared for. Um, it's no different than us, and we're just doing our, the best we can do right now to make that happen for them. But again, you do know our, our scope is limited. Um, we certainly would enlist the help of our community folks to help them. I mean, there's no doubt with that. I'm, you're hearing me talk about it. Um, we would use your help. You know, we obviously like the media to help come out and support. Come out and support our cops and kids that, that, that is every Thursday night at, you know, Cokesbury United Methodist Church where we're, we have a program that's unique to CMPD where we're helping Latino families, a lot of migrant families come out there. That's what I'm talking about, right? So you all can play your part in it too, but as far as the kids, I think it's pretty safe to say they just want what we want, which is to be safe. I wish we could stay all day and keep going, but unfortunately there are schedules to maintain. So um, I want to thank you all for being here, um, members of the media, folks watching. I want to thank the members of our community for their support. Um, we, we do appreciate that. We do feel that. I want to thank the men and women of, of CMPD. Um, we say the CMPD is the best law enforcement agency in the country, and we mean it. Um, thank you for your work, and um, we look forward to a good rest of the year. Thanks.